So a couple of weeks ago when I made a video about the M50 and the M6 Mark II, I made a joke about how I should do a separate video about Canon's product lineup and their naming system. Uh, not so surprisingly, a lot of people commented back saying that I really should. So here I am. So in this video, I'm not going to be talking about their camcorders and professional video cameras or their point and shoot cameras. I'm going to be strictly talking about their DSLR and mirrorless uh, interchangeable lens cameras. There are lots of cameras to cover and I'm going to be going over them very quickly and I'm also gonna leave out uh, some of the older cameras just to make this as simple as possible so if I miss anything if you'd like to add something please leave a comment down below so to start Canon currently has four different lens mount there's the EF mount which has been around for a long time since the late 80s and there's the EFS mount which is the same lens mount but for APS-C cameras and if you don't know the difference between full frame and crop sensor cameras, I have a video just for that on my channel, so please check it out. So again, EF and EFS lens mounts are basically the same, and you can use EF lenses on a crop sensor camera, but you cannot use EFS lenses on a full frame camera. Technically you can, but Canon made it physically impossible. So if you have an EF mount full frame camera, or if you're planning to upgrade to full frame, uh, make sure you get the EF lenses instead of the EFS lenses. And then there's the EFM mount, which is for Canon's crop sensor mirrorless cameras like the M50 or the M6 Mark II, which is a different lens mount, so they're not compatible with EF cameras. And you can use an adapter to use an EF lens on an EFM mount camera, but you cannot use EFM lenses on an EF camera. And then there's the RF mount, which is for Canon's full frame mirrorless cameras like the EOS R and the EOS RP. And then again, you can use an adapter to use any EF lenses on your RF mount cameras, but you cannot use RF mount lenses on your EF cameras. This is just because the EF mount has been around the longest, so they have the biggest lineup of lenses. So if you have an EF mount camera, then there's really no reason to use any other lenses. But if you have an EFM mount camera or an RF mount camera, uh, your selection is pretty limited. So uh, that was Canon's decision to let you use the EF lenses on those cameras. So let's start with the EF mount. The EF mount covers all of their DSLRs, so this might take up more than two thirds of the entire video. Uh, but let's start from the top. So at the very top, there is the Canon 1DX Mark II. The 1DX Mark II is a replacement for the 1DX Mark I. Uh, and there were many different 1D cameras like the 1D Mark I, Mark II, Mark III, Mark IV, 1DS, 1DC. Uh, but the latest uh, edition of that is the 1DX Mark II. And the 1DX Mark II is a big and bulky professional camera for sports and action. So it can shoot up to 14 frames per second and I think 16 if you use the live view. And because of that, it has a very good autofocusing system. And uh, because of that, you're sacrificing a little bit on the resolution. It has a 20 megapixel sensor uh, because you're gonna be shooting lots and lots of photos in a short amount of time. Uh, you're not gonna be shooting like 50 megapixel portraits, but it's a very, very fast and responsive camera. And because of the lower megapixel count, it's also very good in low light situations. And the next step down is the 5D Mark. IV. And the 5D Mark IV is the latest 5D camera and it costs about a half as much as the 1DX Mark II. And the 5D is the most popular camera for professionals because it's the most well-rounded camera for a lot of things, not just sports and action. So it shoots up to 7 frames per second, so it may not be as fast as 1DX Mark II, but at the same time you also have a 30 megapixel sensor, so you're shooting a much higher resolution photo each time. So even though the 5D Mark IV is a lot cheaper than the 1DX Mark II, it does not necessarily mean that it's a worse camera, uh, they're just different. So as you'll see in the next few minutes, in their naming system, um, in Japanese culture, lower number is considered better than higher number, which is one of the reasons why 1D is a better camera than the 5D. But as you'll also notice in the next few minutes, lower numbered cameras aren't always 
better, which is what makes it so confusing. Uh, but bear with me for a second. So below the 5D, there's the 6D Mark II. The 6D Mark II is the replacement for the 6D Mark I. So the 6D Mark II is about $1,000 cheaper than the 5D Mark IV. And uh, it's also a full frame camera. And pretty much the only differences between the 6D Mark II and the 5D Mark IV are that the 6D Mark II has a 26 megapixel sensor uh, compared to the 30 megapixel sensor on the 5D Mark IV. And and it also has a flip out touch screen. So that might be useful if you're gonna be shooting from different angles or if you're gonna be taking selfies or shooting a YouTube video, uh, the 6D Mark II might be the better camera for you. But if you're a professional photographer, especially a wedding photographer, uh, you might still want to consider the 5D Mark IV because the 5D Mark IV has a dual card slot and on the 6D Mark II, there's only one card slot, which means when you're shooting on the 5D Mark IV, you're having an automatic backup of whatever you're shooting. So uh, even if your SD card fails, you still have a backup of that. And on the 6D Mark II, you're just recording on a single SD card. So if your SD card fails, uh, you might lose all your photos. To some people, this might be really important. And to some people, they may not care. So it's really up to you. And then just below the 6D Mark II, there is the 7D Mark II. The 7D Mark II replaces the 7D. And the 7D Mark II is a, a bit older camera. It came out in 2014, I believe. And from what I hear, Canon is not going to make a replacement for that because of the camera that I'm going to talk about next and the 7D Mark II is a sports and action camera like the 1DX Mark II but it's an APS-C camera. It can shoot up to 10 frames per second and it also has dual card slots and Canon tends to leave out the flippy screen on their higher-end professional cameras uh, because that makes the camera a little more durable I guess. And just below the 7D Mark II, our oldest camera on the list, we have the 90D, which is the newest DSLR in the lineup. And here's when the naming system gets a bit confusing because we just went from single digit to double digit. And the single digit, the lower number, meant more expensive cameras. But now uh, we have a 90D and in the double digit, when the number is lower, it means they're cheaper. But once we get to three or four digit number of cameras like the 250D or the 4000D, uh, they're much, much cheaper than the 90D. So the 90D is a replacement for the 80D. And also in some ways, it's like a hybrid of the 80D and the 70 Mark II. It can shoot up to 10 frames per second. And it also has a 32 megapixel sensor, which is the highest resolution sensor in any of the current APS-C Canon lineups. In many ways, it's like the ultimate hybrid camera that can do everything. It can shoot great portraits, it can do fast action, it can do uh, 4K video that's uncropped. It has the flip out touchscreen, which is obviously very useful. And it even has the joystick like on the 70 Mark II, which is very nice if you're shooting sports and action. About the only weakness that the 90D has is that it does not have dual card slots. So that's one advantage that the 70 Mark II still has over the 90D. And moving on to the next camera, which is the 7070D. And the 7070D costs about as half as much of the brand new 90D. And the 7070D is is a much smaller camera than the 90D. And that's one of the main differences between uh, the 7070D and the cameras that I'll talk about from now on with the previous cameras that I just mentioned until now. So the 7070D, uh, kind of similar to the 80D, it has a 24 megapixel APS-C sensor. And because of the smaller body uh, compared to the 80D or the 90D, it has a much smaller battery. And also because of the smaller body, it may lack some physical controls that were present on the 80D or the 90D. But the 90D now being a much newer camera, now it has a much higher resolution sensor. You can shoot 4K uncropped and things like that. Uh, but other than that, there are very similar cameras. And just below the 77D, there is the T7i. And the T7i is also called the 800D outside of the US. So now we're getting into the three digit numbers. And the T7i is about 50 or $100 cheaper than the 77D, but they're very, very similar cameras. Pretty much the only difference between the T7i and the 77D is that the T7i is a very, very slightly smaller camera and it does not have the top LCD screen that's on the 77D. 
And a fun fact, the T7i happens to be the best-selling camera on Amazon, probably because of its balance of price and its features. And just below the T7i, there is the Canon SL3. And the SL3 is also called the 200D Mark II or the 250D, depending on where you live. And it's a cheaper camera than the T7i, but because the SL3 is newer than this T7i, uh, it has a newer processor, which means slightly better low light performance. And one other notable difference between the T7i and the SL3 is that the T7i has a 45-point autofocusing system and the SL3 has a 9-point autofocusing system. And then below the SL3, now we have the 4000D, which is one of the cheapest DSLRs that Canon currently sells. And the 4000D, um, I would normally recommend people to stay away from it and spend a little more money and get the SL3 instead because the 4000D is really Really cheaply made and it also lacks the flip out touchscreen like on the SL3. It's really a camera that doesn't have a lot of reason to buy other than the fact that it's really cheap. So if you want to save some money, just get a used SL3 or an SL2 instead. And now we can finally move on to the mirrorless systems. And currently in the EFM mount system, there are just about three cameras that you should be aware of. And those are the M6 Mark II, the M50, and the M200. The M6 Mark II costs about $850. $50, the M50 costs about $550 and the M200 also costs about $550 with the kit lens. And there are older cameras like the M5, which is technically a higher end camera than the M6 or the M50, but because they're much older, they lack a lot of the features that are on the M6 Mark II or the M50, so I think we can ignore it. So the M6 Mark II was launched at the same time as the 90D, so it has the same 32 megapixel sensor and also the same Digic 8 processor. Uh, the M50 and the M200 also have the same Digic 8 processor, but they have 24 megapixel sensors instead of 32. So because of the reasons that I mentioned in my previous video, it might be better for a lot of people to save $300 and get the M50 instead of the M6 Mark II. But the M6 Mark II has a slightly better autofocusing system and it can shoot higher frame rates and it can also do uncropped 4K, so that's really up to you. The M200 is actually a very similar camera to the M50, uh, but it does not have the viewfinder. So it's like a baby M6 Mark II with M50 specs. And last but not least, let's move on to the RF mount. And in the RF mount system, there are currently just two cameras, uh, the EOS R and the EOS RP. And the EOS R has the same 30 megapixel sensor from the 5D Mark IV, and the EOS RP has the same 26 megapixel sensor from the 6D Mark II. They both have the latest Digic 8 processor, same as the 90D and the M6 Mark II and the M50 and the M200. The EOS R is the slightly bigger camera physically, so it has the bigger battery, the same battery that goes inside the 90D and the 5D Mark IV and all those cameras. And the EOS RP has a smaller battery and the EOS R has a few more pro features like the C-Log or the dual pixel autofocus in 4K and the viewfinder resolution is slightly higher, the response time might be slightly higher, things that not a lot of people might notice. The EOS R has been around a little longer so you can get one for under $2,000, uh, sometimes as low as uh, $1,500 or $1,600. And the EOS RP's launch price was $1,300 and you can now get one slightly cheaper than that. So uh, you just gotta weigh your options and see what's best for you. So I think that was it. And I believe that was the longest video that I've done this year. And again, if you have any other questions, please let me know in the comments. And if you also think I've missed something, if you'd like to add something, uh, just write them in the comments. And um, so yeah, I hope this is helpful and I will see you next time. Bye-bye.